Lake Bodum, Finland, the 5th of June, 1960. Nils Gustafsson couldn't sleep. The 18-year-old fidgeted in his sleeping bag, trying to find a more comfortable position. His friends, Myla, Anya, and Seppo, lay beside him in the cramped tent, all snoring softly. They had been drinking that night, sharing ghost stories around the campfire. Niels could feel the alcohol sitting heavy and sour in his stomach. His head was beginning to pound. Niels fumbled for his flashlight, shielding the bulb so as not to wake the others. He peered at his watch in the darkness. 3 a.m. It was going to be a long night. He sighed and slumped back against the hard earth. Outside the tent, the forest was quiet. The wind rustled the branches of the trees, and tiny creatures scurried through the undergrowth. Niels's mind wandered. He thought about the stories he had been told as a child, tales of the trolls and giants that roamed the dark Finnish forests, or of the hideous Ikuturso, a monstrous octopus with dragon's wings that hauled itself from deep lakes to feast upon unsuspecting travelers. Niels shuddered. Their tent was pitched only a few meters from the shores of Lake Bodum. The Ikuturso could be dragging its slimy bulk towards them, right? A branch snapped in the darkness. Niels bolted upright, mouth dry, heart suddenly hammering erratically. He strained his ears. The seconds crawled by. Nothing. Niels grinned to himself in the darkness. He must have drunk more than he thought. Trolls. <laughs> Bumps in the night. He was far too old to be scaring himself with such nonsense. He settled back down. Beside him, Myla mumbled something incoherent in her sleep. He listened to her gentle breathing and tried to drift off. But he couldn't shake the feeling that there was a presence, something sinister, watching them from the darkness. And he shivered. He was right to worry, for this would not end well. The Slaughter at Lake Bodum a bite-sized fright. This series contains disturbing content. Listener discretion is advised. Something brushed past the side of the tent, inches from Niels's head. This time he was certain of it. There was something large moving slowly through the undergrowth outside. A wolf? A bear, maybe? Niels held his breath, tried to make himself as small as possible. He felt the side of the tent begin to bulge inwards. A knife suddenly tore through the fabric wall, plunging down in a blur of flashing steel. Blood sprayed across the inside of the tent as one of the sleeping campers was struck, and Niels screamed. He tried to scramble away from the scything blade, his legs tangled in his sleeping bag. Around him, his friends jerked awake, adding their own confused yells to the chaos. They too tried to rise, to flee, but they were cut or clubbed down in a merciless frenzy of vicious blows. A fine mist of blood seemed to fill the air. Niels managed to kick his legs free and struggled towards the opening of the tent. His panicking fingers fumbled with the heavy canvas for what seemed like an eternity. Behind him, the knife blows still rained down, though the screaming of his friends had become ominously quiet. Finally, Niels succeeded in tearing the tent flap aside and tumbled out onto the forest floor, gasping like a fish out of water. He was slick, with warm blood, drenched in it, though whether it was his own or that of his friends, he could not tell. He tried to stand, but his legs would not support him. Niels began to crawl. He stopped when he realized the forest around him had become deathly still. No screams, no wet smacks of metal entering flesh. He turned his head and looked back towards the tent. It was now nothing more than a ragged, bloody heap of shredded canvas, barely covering a tangled mass of bodies. A dark shape stood unmoving beside the tent, looming impossibly tall in the moonlight. The figure turned to face him, and Niels saw two red eyes glowing in a featureless black face. The terrified teenager lay in the dirt, 
paralyzed with fear. The terrifying shape moved, seeming to glide noiselessly through the undergrowth, closer and closer, until it filled his vision, towering above him. There was a flash of steel, and Niels looked down to see the handle of a knife protruding from his side. He felt little pain, mostly a spreading numbness as he watched his blood pool in the grass. With great effort, he lifted his head. The red eyes bored into him unblinkingly. Then something struck him in the side of the head, and the world went black. That chilling account was the story of the killings that occurred on a summer morning at Lake Bodum, located in Espoo, Finland. It was based on the testimony given by the sole survivor, 18-year-old Nils Gustafsson. He had been found the following morning, lying unconscious on the crushed remains of the tent. Nils had been viciously beaten. His jaw was broken, his body covered in bloody bruises. He had also been stabbed multiple times, but at least he was still breathing. His girlfriend, 15-year-old Myla Björklund, and their friends Anya Maki and Seppo Boisman were not so lucky. Anya and Seppo were still inside the tent. They had been stabbed and bludgeoned to death, slaughtered before they had any hope of escape. Myla was found outside, lying next to Nils. She had suffered the most frenzied, brutal attack with many of her wounds inflicted after her death. The four teenagers had set up their camp along the shores of the picturesque Lake Bodum, situated around 20 kilometers northeast of the Finnish capital, Helsinki. It is this lakeside setting, along with the brutal and bloody nature of the slayings, that has led some to speculate that these vicious acts may have been the inspiration behind the cult classic horror movie. Friday the 13th. In the film, which was released almost 20 years to the day of the Lake Bodum killings, a group of teenagers are terrorized and savagely murdered, one by one, by a mysterious, knife-wielding maniac. Though the filmmakers deny taking any influence from the real murders, a study of images of Lake Bodum will reveal undeniable similarities between it and the fictional setting of the film, the now infamous Camp Crystal Lake. The case has been frequently referred to as the real Friday the 13th. No one has ever been convicted for the killings at Lake Bodum. The case has remained unsolved for over 60 years. However, this does not mean that there weren't any suspects. When Nils Gustafsson was interviewed by the police, he claimed he could remember but little of what happened on that terrible night. Everything was a blurred, bloody haze in his memory, but he did provide a description of the killer. Niels spoke of a tall, black apparition with red eyes that burned like coals in the darkness. Before long, locals began to whisper about the Grim Reaper himself having stolen away those young lives. There were other, less supernatural suspects. Local teenager Penti Soinanen was a known criminal. He had a list of convictions including theft, assault and robbery, and also had apparent psychopathic tendencies. He reportedly confessed to the brutal slayings whilst in prison, providing police with rambling, cryptic answers when questioned further. His confession was dismissed as jailhouse bragging. Soinanen hanged himself in prison in 1969. He would have been 15 years old at the time the murders were committed. The majority of public suspicion fell on Hans Asman, a German immigrant who lived a few miles from Lake Bodum. He was rumored to have been a guard at the Auschwitz concentration camp during World War II and an alleged spy for the KGB, the notorious Soviet secret police. On the day after the tragedy at the lakeside had occurred, Asman walked into a Helsinki hospital looking disheveled with blackened fingernails and clothes stained with what appeared to be blood. His behavior seemed odd. He acted nervously and was aggressive towards hospital staff. He also reportedly shaved off his long blonde hair after rumors began to circulate that a mysterious blonde man had been spotted leaving the crime scene. He was questioned by the police and ultimately dismissed as a suspect after providing an alibi for the night of the killing. 
However, he has since been linked with at least two other high-profile, unsolved Finnish murders, and he is still considered by many to be a prime suspect in the Lake Bodum case. Then there was Valdemar Yilström, a local shop owner who was known around town for his erratic, violent behavior, throwing stones at passing cyclists and cutting down people's tents. With his seemingly pathological hatred for campers, Yilström is also thought to have provided inspiration for the killer in Friday the 13th. He reportedly confessed to the Lake Bodum murders to a neighbor while they sat in a sauna. It was also rumored that he had filled in a well on his land a few days after the bodies were found. However, he had a seemingly airtight alibi. His wife stated that he had been at home with her all through the night. She later alleged, on her deathbed, that Yilström had forced her to provide him with an alibi, threatening to murder her too if she betrayed him. Shortly after his confession in the sauna, Yilström drowned himself in Lake Bodum. Rumor has it, on the anniversary of the tragic event that stole the life of the three unfortunate teenagers. What is remarkable about this case is the sheer number of credible suspects the Finnish police had, several of whom had actually confessed to committing the grisly act. Yet all were dismissed. None of the men could be placed at the scene of the crime on that night. None save one, that is. The sole survivor of the attack, Nils Gustafsson. In 2004, Gustafsson was arrested in a shocking turn of events, accused of murdering his friends 44 years earlier on the shore of Lake Bodum in a jealous, drunken rage. The now 62-year-old Niels vehemently protested his innocence. The prosecution team at his trial begged to differ. Modern forensic analysis of old evidence implicated Gustafsson as the killer, and they were convinced that they finally knew the truth about what happened that night. Niels was drunk. He crouched alone in the dark forest. His head was swimming, and his eyes prickled with suppressed tears. He took a long swig of vodka from the bottle that rested at his feet. The liquor burned his throat, but at least it dulled the hammering pain in his face. Niels gingerly touched his jaw and winced. Broken, he thought. That smug bastard Seppo had hit him, hard, hard enough to loosen a few teeth. And the girls had just laughed, told him he was drunk, told him to go away until he could behave himself. Whores. No, Niels thought, not whores. The opposite, standoffish and cold. At least where he was concerned, Myla never wanted to take things as far as Niels did. But she hadn't seemed so reluctant when she was flirting with Seppo around the campfire, had she? Niels balled his hands into tight fists. She was meant to be his girlfriend. So he had launched himself at Seppo, and Seppo had knocked him down into the dirt. And now he was here, alone in the woods, while Anya and Myla and Seppo were back at the tent doing... Doing what? He rose to his feet. Rage and vodka swirled together, hot in his stomach. Whatever they were up to, he wouldn't stand for it. He tossed the bottle into the trees and lurched off into the darkness. Niels stumbled into the campsite. It was quiet, but he thought he could hear giggling coming from inside the tent. Another hot wave of anger crashed through his body. They were probably laughing about him in there and touching each other. He spotted the tent peg mallet lying in the grass and bent to pick it up. The weight felt good in his clenched fist. After a moment, he tugged the hunting knife from his belt. He crept forward until it was right up against one of the tent walls. His hand seemed to suddenly move with a purpose all of its own, plunging the knife down. There was an awful scream. The blade stuck fast in clinging wet flesh. Niels wrenched it free and then stabbed down again, and again, and again, and again. Someone tried to rise inside the tent and he swung the mallet, clubbing them back down. Blood soaked the canvas walls, spattering Niels's hands and face and clothes. There was blood in his eyes. He could no longer see clearly, but he kept swinging and stabbing, 
adding his own incoherent yells to the screams of his treacherous friends. When the bodies under the canvas finally stopped twitching, Nils took a lurching step backwards. The rage inside him was still burning, blinding, crying out for more. He tore a few bloody shreds of the tent aside until he found Myla, and then dragged her corpse out into the moonlight. Her sightless eyes seemed to glare at him accusingly. He couldn't stand it. He raised the knife high again, ready to rip and tear and twist to punish her over and over and over. Nils stood back, surveying the carnage he had brought about. The rage had subsided, leaving behind a hollow exhaustion. But he wasn't done yet. There were still a few things Nils needed to take care of. He turned and slowly wandered a few hundred yards into the dark forest. Here he carefully removed his blood-soaked shoes and hid them in the undergrowth. He stumbled back to camp barefoot and stood in the ragged remains of the tent. His friend's blood was cold between his toes. Niels looked down at the mallet he still clutched in his hand. It was spattered with gore and matted hair. He smashed himself in the side of the skull with it, reeling, almost losing consciousness. He struck himself again, and bright stars popped and flashed behind his eyelids. He repeatedly plunged the knife in his other hand into his own side, his arms and his chest. The wounds were not deep, but his blood flowed freely and Nils felt consciousness begin to slip away. Summoning the last of his strength, he turned and hurled his weapons, one after the other, into the dark waters of Lake Bodum. They disappeared immediately, swallowed up with barely a ripple. Nils staggered and collapsed next to Myla on top of the crushed tent. She was unmoving, ghostly pale. Nils felt nothing. He rolled onto his back. The sky overhead was beginning to brighten with the first light of dawn. Nils closed his eyes to sleep. The prosecution's case centered around the fact that whoever had carried out the murders had been wearing Nils Gustafsson's shoes at the time. They had been found a few hundred meters from the crime scene, covered in blood determined to belong to Anya, Myla, and Seppo. But no trace of Nils' blood was found. They concluded that Nils must have been injured at a different point in time than the other three, and that his wounds, which were noticeably less severe, were self-inflicted. He also matched the description of a man who had been observed near the crime scene by two bird watchers a few hours before the bodies were discovered. Not everyone was convinced of Niels Gustafsson's guilt, however. In 2005, he was acquitted of all charges and awarded almost 45,000 euros as compensation for his mental suffering during his long time in custody. In spite of this, there are still many in Finland who believe Nils is the most likely suspect in these gruesome slayings. Who do you think was responsible for the slaughter at Lake Bodum? Was it the camper-hating psychopath, or the mysterious KGB spy already linked to so many other savage crimes? Perhaps it was the jealous boyfriend driven to kill in a drunken rage, or maybe the locals were right. And it was the Grim Reaper himself who had stalked the shores of Lake Bodum that night, eager for innocent souls. It seems as though we will never know for certain. We would love to hear your own theories and ideas about this mysterious case. If you have enjoyed this episode, please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Pixel Elixir, and subscribe at BitesizedFrights.com to make sure that you never miss any of our terrifying tales. This has been a Pixel Elixir production, narrated by Chris K. Thank you for listening. Until the next bite, my friends.